Let me ask you to turn in your copy of God's Word back to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I want to draw your attention this morning to verse 10b, the second half of verse 10 through verse 12. We looked at the first half of verse 10 last week. For those of you that were with us last week, we looked at the first part of verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 2. This morning we'll pick up in the middle of verse 10 and continue speaking on false teachers. I'll go ahead and read the beginning of verse 10, so just so you won't be lost. Uh, so there in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning of verse 10, the Apostle Peter is speaking of false teachers. And he writes, And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. And he goes on to say, Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce blasphemous judgments against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, uh, uh, um, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming, against matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we are humbled as we open Your Word together. And as we read this warning this morning in particular against these false teachers that Your Son Jesus Christ warned us would creep into churches throughout the ages. Lord, we pray that we might have our eyes wide open today, that you, we would hear your warning, that we would guard against, we would guard your church against these false teachers, and that we would be warned that these characteristics would not creep into our own lives. And so we lean hard upon your grace today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Allow me to lead your people well today. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, as we read here in the text, we've been looking at the topic of false teachers. As we've seen over the last several weeks, the entire chapter 2 of 2 Peter revolves around this topic of false teachers. And while I was somewhat tempted to sort of rush through this, I, I, I think I would be doing a disservice to you if we did so. Peter spends a great bit of time speaking of false teachers, and we would be failing in our responsibility if we ran through it. But at the same time, I have to say that it is almost breathtaking as, as I, I mentioned last week, I think that Peter almost goes into a rant at this point. I don't know how else to describe it. He's already warned us about false teachers in the opening verses of this chapter. He gave us the assurance of their defeat in the middle part of the chapter and where you thought that he was maybe uh, com uh, uh, just completely uh, shot the lights out on this topic. When we hit verse 10, it seems like he's just getting warmed up. And he just, just goes with words after words after words, making sure that we hear this warning. And so we want to do that this morning. In just these three verses, or really two and a half verses, he gives us another, the way that I count them, basically seven more characteristics of false teachers for us to think about this morning. Uh, don't worry, this is not a seven-point sermon, uh, Larry. There's probably more like 18. I don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly how many points, but there are seven characteristics, and we're going to kind of work through those, not spending too much time with each one of them because they sort of mesh together and overlap with each other, and, and so it's sort of hard to talk about one without mentioning others, and hopefully you'll see that as we work through them. But as we look at these set of characteristics in particular in these few verses, two and a half verses here, I can't help but think that Peter has some specific people in mind. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to say too much or read into it too much, but 
He's so, he's so particular with their personalities and the character traits in their life. I can't help but think that when Peter is mentioning these, the, these characteristics, even though he does not mention their names, when he's listing these characteristics, that the church is receiving this letter, they're, they're shaking their head, oh, we know who he's talking about now. You know what I'm saying? It just he's, he's that particular with their personalities. And the reason I say that is I, I think that it is important to note that he does not use their names here. Not that there's anything wrong with name and names. Sometimes the Bible does name names. I don't want to take the time to turn to it, but I think it's back in, in 2 Timothy, for example, and there's several examples actually. But the one that popped in my mind this week as I was thinking about this is the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy when he mentions by name Alexander the coppersmith. Now we don't know much about Alexander the coppersmith. It might be the same Alexander that's mentioned in the book of Acts. We're not exactly sure, but whatever the case, in uh, Paul's writings he said, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. May the Lord repay him according to his deeds. I think the way is the King James tra uh, translates that, that, Larry. Basically, he's saying, I hope God gets him. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and he names his name. You know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't shrink back from that. And so sometimes the Bible sp na names specific people's names, and sometimes it avoids that. And, and I, I was thinking, I think that we can learn a lesson even from that. Sometimes it's appropriate to name names, and sometimes it's inappropriate to name names. And this is especially important, I think. I mentioned the Southern Baptist Convention happening uh, this past week. And in our Southern Baptist context, there, this is a, a rather big debate and discussion uh, in, in recent years. When is it appropriate to name names and when is it inappropriate uh, to name names? Sometimes people will refer to the 11th commandment of Southern Baptist, which is, thou shalt not speak ill of another Southern Baptist. And a lot of well-known Southern Baptists in, uh, our, in our circles will, will, will not mention people's names, other Southern Baptists, of other entities, and those types of things. And they receive some criticism uh, for that. However, I, I think that it's, sometimes it's appropriate, and sometimes it's not appropriate. And it takes great wisdom to know the difference. As, you, as most of you know, I don't shrink back from naming names from the pulpit oftentimes especially when it comes to false teachers. I think la just last week I gave a whole long list of, of those who are in our culture today on the airwaves and on the internet and publishing books that are very popular by, that, that are unequivocally false teachers. And the Bible says that we should mark them and name them and, and warn our flocks and our congregations and our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ against them. However, there is, I think, sometimes a danger, and I think this is why some of our Southern Baptist leaders, for example, Brian, will not mention names, because sometimes it detracts from the warnings that are more important than the particular names attached to the false teaching, but to get to the false teaching itself, to tell you exactly why it is uh, that this doctrine or that philosophy or this particular ideology is wrong. Because if all we did, think about it this way, see if this makes sense. If all we did is say, here's a list of names of teachers that you should avoid. And this, that's all you know, okay, I'll avoid these teachers. And you don't know anything about why we should avoid them. When some other no-name person teaches the same thing, we may fall for it. And so I, I think it's, it's better oftentimes, probably more often than not, to teach upon the philosophies that are wrong, the doctrine that is wrong. So no matter who is espousing these types of things, that we can be warned about them in both the content of their teaching and the character of those teachings. And so we are here in 2 Peter chapter 2, and he doesn't tell us who specifically he's talking about. The church then probably knew. But he says no matter who he is, if he has these kinds of characteristics, we need to watch out. We need to be warned. Whether he has a big name and is publishing books, or he's a no-name person that we can't even recall what his name is, if he has these characteristics, we need to be forewarned. 
if they're spouting false doctrine, it doesn't matter uh, what, what, uh, what, what their name is and whether they are in a database or not. We need to be warned. And so that's what the Apostle Peter is doing here. So let's look at some of these characteristics this morning. Look with me right there in the middle of verse 10. If you have the ESV, English Standard Version, the first word in this list that I want you to see is the word bold. So these false teachers are bold. Well, there's a word pair there, bold and willful. We'll look at them together in, in a minute, but let's look at them one at a time uh, briefly. He says that these false teachers are bold. Now you might be saying, hold on, Brother Don, or hold on, Brother Peter. Uh, isn't being bold a good thing? Shouldn't we be bold? Uh, and, and my answer to that is yes. We need to make sure that we don't just take this word out of context and say that, and it seem to imply that Peter is saying there's anything wrong with boldness. No, we as believers ought to be bold. We ought not to be timid. We ought not to shrink back. We ought not to whisper about things that God is very vocal about. And so boldness, properly understood, is right and good and proper. That we should be bold, but we need to be humbly bold. What Peter is talking about here is an arrogant boldness. We know this because it's coupled with that word willful. And in some of your translations, it may actually be translated as arrogant. It's a bold arrogance. Or I've, I've, actually, the, the King James uh, Version uh, translates this word bold as presumptuous. And, and so the word actually means bold, but in the context of the, everything that Peter's talking about here, he's talking about a presumptuous boldness, a boldness that is inappropriate. It's not, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be bold. You're standing on things that, that you know nothing about. He couples it with ignorance in just a moment. And so there's, there's a presumptuous boldness that Peter is warning us about. Or in the New American Standard uh, translation, it, it translates it uh, as, as daring, I think. You know, sort of, or, or as uh, John MacArthur says, uh, a recklessness, a recklessness. I, I would translate it probably foolhardiness. Uh, that these false teachers are foolhardy. Uh, they're, they're talking about things that they know nothing about. They're going in, and, and to, to, to borrow from one of the, the th points that we'll make in just a moment, it, they're, they're rushing in where angels fear to tread. There's this boldness there that is inappropriate. And, and, and so there's an arrogance, there's this bold arrogance and that bold arrogance is coupled with ignorance they said they're talking about things that they don't even understand and and that that is a that is a horrible connection uh to have two two characteristics i have both arrogance and ignorance when you put those two things together it's bad either one by itself is bad enough but you put arrogance and ignorance together is really bad uh i have little patience with those who have both of those one or the other you know, you can kind of live with, especially ignorance. If you think about it, ignorance, ignorance, I, I mean, and when I say ignorance, it means, you know, not knowing something. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if, you, if somebody's ignorant and they're humble about it, you know, I, I can, we can live with that. Uh, as long as they're humble and they want to learn and they want to grow and, and yet they're ignorant, there, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, ignorance is not a virtue. Ignorance is not a virtue, but ignorance is not a vice either, Right? And so if someone's humbly ignorant, it's okay. But it's when they're arrogantly ignorant, that's when you run into problems. Or, or if you're, they're just arrogant and they're not ignorant, I was thinking, uh, this, if this makes sense, is if, if somebody's just arrogant and they can back it up, you know, I, I can kind of live with that. Now, I'm not, I'm not endorsing arrogance. The Bible says pride comes before a fall and pride is, is, is a problem. But if, somebody, uh, if somebody's arrogant, and they can kind of back it up, and I'm thinking of a few uh, particular teachers that I know uh, that, are, that are like that, that, you know, I kinda, you kind of look the other way because they can back it up. But when you have ignorance, uh, 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 ag uh, arrogance and ignorance at the same time, Peter's like, you, you got to watch out for those kind of guys. And, and so P Peter is being very, and I say it in those, those terminologies because I want you to see how practical Peter is being here. And you, and you see why I kind of have this feeling that some guys in the church at the time are saying, oh, we know what Peter's talking about. Uh, they, they know exactly, and, and some of y'all might even be thinking of some people. They're, they're ignorant, they don't know what they're talking about, but they sure think they do, and they sure th they, they'll tell you everything, they know, they'll tell you everything they know and a lot that they don't know 
They're sure about it. They, uh, they, they, they never question anything. They know everything. And, they're, and when they come to find out, they really don't know anything. And so Peter is warning about that kind of personality trait that is both arrogant and ignorant. They are bold. They are reckless. They are daring when they should not be. They are arrogant. They are willful. The, the, the actual word there that, the, um, that, that Peter is using there for arrogant, some translations I said translate as arrogant, willful, they're pushing their own will is, is what, is what this, the idea behind that is. That they want their own way, they want their own will, uh, they don't want to take anybody else's uh, opinions, nobody else's view, they're just dead set on what they want to do and what their decision is and not taking any input from God or anyone else. And we see that is not a biblical trait. The Bible tells, what does the Bible tell us? What did Jesus tell us that when, how we ought to pray? In, in, in the model prayer, you're familiar with it, you know it, uh, you can quote it, most of you can quote it yourself. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The problem is, many of us want to pray, my will be done. We want our will, not God's will. And so a false teacher is willful. He's pointing to push his own will, not being humble and subservient to God's will. And whatever God wants is first and foremost. No, instead he pushes his own will. And he disregards God's will and disregards the will of others, disregards other people's opinions, uh, which, which I think is, 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 is also what, well, Pete, what Peter is saying here as we take the, all of the Scriptures is a poor character trait a Christian character trait. I love the passage in the book of Proverbs that says that there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. You know, you know what that means is that when you're making a decision, when you're making a decision, you have to, you have to do something. The first, third, first thing that you ought to do is what is God's will? You know, that, that's, the, that's the overarching thing. But the truth of the matter is that there's some uh, issues that God is, uh, gives some leeway on you know, if, if you're praying about a moral issue, well, God has spoken clearly on that. But sometimes, you know, there's, there's some, some leeway in maybe this would be acceptable, maybe that would be acceptable, which is the, the best decision to make. And the Bible says that it's helpful, it's wise to have a multitude of counselors. And so you prayerfully consider it. There's a humility there. And you ask some com uh, confident uh, friends or uh, fellow Christians, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? And what are your thoughts on this? And you take those, those things together to help you make a decision instead of just running headlong in your own way. What Peter's saying, a good teacher, a good pastor, a good leader is not going to be willful, pushing his own will. But no, he's going to have a multitude of counselors. Now, I, I know that this is difficult to, to put into practice and and being a pastor for as long as I have, I've seen the difficulty sometimes uh, there where you try to get a multitude of counselors and people sometimes misunderstand you, uh, misunderstand how that's going. I, I'm not going to give any particular details, but I'm thinking of some situations that happened a long, long time ago. And, and, I, and I went around and, and said, well, what do you think about this? And, and what, what, what was your opinion? And what would you do? And what, what do you think? And, and I listened to all these different people and prayerfully considered what course of action would be best and it hurt some people's feelings because I didn't take their opinion. Uh, one, one guy even told me, well, why'd you ask my opinion if you wasn't going to do what I said? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey, that didn't mean I totally disregarded your opinion. Uh, actually, it helped me think through it. Now, I didn't do what, specifically what you were recommending. However, it helped me to think through all the different possibilities, and it was very helpful because there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. You see, that's the biblical attitude that we ought to have as we uh, move forward in the Christian life. Not, as Peter says, these false teachers are bold, daring, reckless, willful, arrogant, pushing their own way. He says, no, when you come across someone like that, you need to be careful. And very likely they are a false teacher. And so he says, bold and arrogant. Number three, in this list, he says, he's, he says uh, let's see, bold and, uh, uh, and, and willful. He says, number three, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, 
This is an interesting phrase here. I want to unpack it a little bit because we need to ask the question, what is he talking about? I mean, what is he talking about? These, these, they don't tremble when they blaspheme or slander or speak against the glorious ones. Who are these glorious ones that Peter is referring to? Well, this is one of those cases where it's very important, terminologically speaking, how to interpret Scripture, that we read it in its context and also compare Scripture with Scripture. And I won't take the time to go through the weeds and go through um, the, the whole process of how we come to the conclusion of what Peter's talking about here, but if we compare it to the next verse that he's talking about angels and compare it with what he says in the parallel passage in Jude. Remember I told you a few weeks ago in this section, is very similar to Jude and I gave you a homework assignment. If you didn't read Jude, go home this week and read Jude and compare it with Second Peter chapter 2 and you'll see the parallels there. What the glorious ones that Peter is referring to here is, in, in, in fact, demons. Demons. Uh, and I know you might say, wait, demons, glorious ones? That sounds like it's a good thing. Well, why is it demons? Well, he's talking about those in the celestial realm. In, in fact, actually, the NIV translation, I think, translates it celestial ones to kind of help us out to understand what's going on there. And like I said, I won't take the time to, to look at Jude and see it all there, but you'll, you'll see that that's what Peter is talking about. And so what, what does he mean by this? What is, it, what is he talking about here when he, at, when he says that these false teachers, they don't even tremble. They, 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 they go in uh, uh, full heartily and slander or, or, or speak ill of these demons. He says, and, and let, let, let's, let's finish out the thought, and then I'll come back and see how we can apply it to our day. He, he says in verse 11, he, he says, whereas angels, he says, basically, I'll tell you what, he, what he's saying. He says, look, angels don't even do that. He says, the good angels don't even do what the false teachers do. He is, is speaking slanderously and flippantly, and, and acting like it's no big deal to interact with demons. He said, he said, they don't even tremble when they do it. He says, not even angels do that. Notice what he says. He says, he says in verse 11, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, the angels are greater in might than power, do not pr pronounce blasphemous judgments against, against them before the Lord. In other words, what the angels do, what the angels do is they leave it to God. They, they leave that kind of thing to God. They don't take it upon themselves. And so I don't know exactly what was happening in Peter's day that Peter is pushing back against, but we can see the principle there. And the principle has some pretty direct application to us today. And I hesitate whether or not I ought to, well, it's going to bring this out or not because it's really not a problem in our circles necessarily. Um, however, in charismatic circles, uh, it, it's sort of a problem, and, and, and so I, I want to men, mention it, uh, some things that I've seen from our brothers and sisters in Christ who lean charismatic, or, or actually more than lean charismatic, this is usually coming uh, from people who are extremely charismatic, uh, when, I, I, I just go ahead and lay it on the table. You ever heard some people preach, and I remember, I, I, I mean, praying, and I've heard people, charismatics especially, praying this way, they'll be praying along, and they're praying to God, and they're kind of getting into it, and then all of a sudden they shift from, from talking to God, and they start talking to the devil. You ever, you ever seen that? If you hadn't seen it, good. You listen to the better people. But uh, sometimes they get into that, and they start rebuking the devil, and start talking to the devil, and telling the devil this, and telling the devil that, and telling demons where to go, and all these kind of things. And, you know, I rebuke you, devil, in the name of... And, and they're doing all these types of things. And you wonder, where, where do they get that kind of thing from? Now, now, in their defense, in their defense, there are passages in the Bible. We do see Jesus, for example, doing that very thing, right? We see Jesus uh, saying, get thee behind me, Satan, right? We, we see Jesus doing that. We see Jesus uh, casting demons out of the guy and into the pigs. Remember that story where he cast demons into the pigs and the pigs run, run off the cliff and jump in the lake and drown? And so Jesus does that kind of thing. But newsflash, you're not Jesus and neither am I. And so uh, I, I believe that if we take the whole counsel of God, that's what for Jesus to do. And when, 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 when we try to take on that role ourselves, we, we are overstepping our bounds and are being bold where we should not be bold. 
Now we do, we do resist the devil, right? The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. Well, how do you resist the devil? By naming names and telling the devil to do this and claiming it in, word, in a word faith type of way? No, the Bible tells us how we are to resist the devil. We're to put on the whole armor of God. We're to put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're to put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That is how we're going to do battle with Satan. To humbly and prayerfully seek God's will and follow the power of the Holy Spirit and, 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 and rely in His Word and seek holiness in, in our lives and seek to be more like Christ. Not walking around flippantly telling demons what to do and, and all, the, all the rest. I remember years ago reading a book of that nature. And I, can't, I think the, the title was Spiritual Warfare. I don't remember the uh, author's name. and I probably wouldn't tell you even if I did. I want you to go look it up. It was not a good book. Uh, the first chapter wasn't too bad. And then, and then the later chapters, he starts getting into some things that, um, that sounded pretty intriguing and then, and then it start, just started really getting weird. Uh, and, and what this guy was doing is he, he took some passages out of the Bible. So, so, for example, so for example, we do know a few things about the demon world, right? Uh, we've mentioned that in, actually even in this study. We think of the Apostle Paul talking about principalities and powers and the rule of the darkness in this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And, and we said, apparently, as far as we can understand it, it seems like what Paul is talking about here is various ranks of, in the demon army, basically. And, and, but we really don't know much more than that. But this guy writing this book did. He knew all about it. And he, 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 had, he knew exactly how it worked and how the, the ranks worked in the, demon, in, in, the, in, devil, in the devil's army and how the assignments were given and, and how things worked and everything. And he even knew different demons' names. Uh, every, every sickness had its own name. So like if somebody had bronchitis, they had the spirit of bronchitis. And in order to, to, to counteract the spirit of bronchitis, you had sort of some kind of spell or incantation. Well, he didn't call them spells or incantations, but that's basically what it was. Is you had to say these particular words to cast out the spirit of, of bronchitis. I speak against you, the spirit of bronchitis. You know, those ty types of things. That's not what the, how the Bible speaks. That's not how the Bible calls us to counteract uh, Satan. Uh, what, 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 uh, what they, I, I, and while, like I said, I don't know if that's exactly what was happening in Peter's day, but it sure does apply. It sure does apply. It's exactly what Peter is talking about. The, these, these false teachers are bold and reckless and daring and brass and fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I don't know if that's where that phrase theology came from, but it sure fits exactly what Peter is talking about here. No, instead what we are to do is recognize that there are, in fact, yes, spiritual forces at work in this world. And we should guard ourselves against those forces. And we should not be ignorant of the devil's devices. But know that we cannot battle the devil on our own terms, and our own power, and our own strength. But instead, we battle him by submitting our will to Christ and, allow, and watch as Christ wins the battle in our praise. You see, that's the opposite of what Peter is telling us these false teachers are like who are bold, who are reckless, who are arrogant, who don't even tremble as they enter into battle with Satan's forces. Another application here that I don't think is direct, but I think falls under the larger principle that Peter is talking about here, that false teachers treat the demonic flippantly, just treat it flippantly as if it's something that they can handle, as something that they can manage. And I think it's appropriate for me to give a word of warning here this morning at Lakeshore Baptist Church because I hear from multiple, from multiple sources just in the last few weeks that medium, consulting mediums and soothsayers and, and channelers and trying to speak to the dead through those kinds of things is getting very popular here in Hancock County. It may be across the country. I don't know. I don't really keep up with those kinds of things. But I know here in our own community, things are happening. And there's some spiritual battles going on. And there are those who 
will claim to be Christian who are dabbling with some of those types of things. And I'm sure it's out of ignorance. I'm sure it's out of not understanding. But we as believers, especially you as Christians, as Lakeshore Baptist Church, need to be aware of it. And to be aware of how to handle those kinds of things. And that we handle it through prayer. We handle it humbly. And we handle it with the truth. Not being bold and brash and trying to, to conjure up incantations and spells and to holding our mouth just right and doing what kind of crazy things. No, we depend upon Christ humbly in prayer, standing for the truth. But Peter says these false teachers have all sorts of things that they do, and one of those is that they rush in without even trembling. Let's move on to look at verse 12 and see another characteristic that he uses here for these false teachers. He says, but they are like, but these are like um, irrational animals. That's the next in the list. Irrational animals. This is, I'll show you how these kind of things all sort of fit together. But they're irrational. They're, they're against reason. That's what the word irrational means. And without, I feel like I'm going into the Greek uh, too much in the last few weeks, but the, the Greek word here is aloga, uh, which if, if you're familiar with the Greek language at all, oftentimes the alpha privative, when there's an A at the beginning, it means the negative, like we would say non or ir. Ir means not uh, uh, rational, so it's not rational. Aloga is, is the word logos, which is the word for logos, which means a word as in the Word of God, or logic, and re where we get our English word logic from, and reason. He said these false teachers, here's what that means, if you got lost in that explanation. Here's what it means. He says these false teachers, they don't use logic, they don't use reason, they don't use rationality, they don't analyze a situation and use their God-given wisdom. Instead, they're against wisdom. They're against logic. They're against using reason. Instead, the opposite of that is in that next phrase, they are creatures of instinct. They just go by their emotions. Whatever they feel, whatever, the first thing that pops in their mind, that's what they do. Instead of thinking through things uh, methodically and analyzing the situation, looking at the options, instead, it's just, they just go by instinct. Whatever's the first thing that pops in their mind, that's what they do. Now, there, there's, some, there, there's some strong application here. Now, I need to be careful because I do know that God wires all of us a little bit differently. And I know that God has wired me to think, to try to think through things logically and oftentimes to my fault. Uh, and and that's, that's why I get, get along with a few of you guys uh, because I think we think the same way. We want to think through logically and analyze things. And, and, and in our defense... That's a biblical trait. That's what we ought to do. Uh, it, we ought not just go with the first thing that pops in our minds and just run with it. Uh, no, that's what Peter's saying. Look, that's a characteristic of a false teacher. That, that's a characteristic of a bad guy. Uh, that's a guy that's going to end in destruction. If you just go by the first thing that pops in your mind, just what, uh, going on your feelings, just on your, your emotions, instead, we're to think through those things. Now, I know I have to get a footnote in that sometimes that we can go too far on one extreme or the other, but this is the general principle that thought and reason and logic and wisdom are gifts from God. Now, sure, emotions and instinct and feelings are also a gift from God, but there is an order that God gives us on how we are to make decisions and how we are to lead our church and to lead our families and to lead and push forward in our businesses and our social interactions and all the rest. That we are not anti-intellectual people. We are not against reason. We don't make an idol of reason. We don't make a God of logic. But God has given us those thought processes to go through. And if we look at our generation today, which side of that equation are we faulting in? I think it's pretty obvious. Now, there has been times in, in, in the past, in Christian history, where, the, they have made, where folks have made an idol of reason and logic 
uh, in Notre Dame uh, Cathedral in France, the one that burned the roof a few years ago. There is actually a statue there to the goddess of reason, making reason into something to be worshipped. And so that was a fault in that generation. Our generation in America today may not have a bronze statue standing up for emotion in a cathedral somewhere, but it is sure on the pages of every book. Do they still make books? On the pages of every internet website and every YouTube channel and the podcasts and the news uh, things and the sitcoms and all the rest. We are told to just go with your feelings, go with your emotions. And if anyone is to stand against that tide, we are seen as those who are outmoded, uncaring, and whatever other epithets they want to cast upon us. But let me encourage you, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you think through things, you are being biblical. Now we're to do it educated by God's Word, seeking His wisdom. And sometimes that often will go against the wisdom of this this world because the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And so he pairs those two things together. These false teachers are irrational, are like irrational animals. They are creatures of instinct. And then the next one, I lost track of uh, what number this would be, but he says, they are born to be caught and destroyed. Here's a word picture that he's using. he's, he's, He's likening these false teachers to animals whose only good purpose in life is to be caught and destroyed. I'm thinking that what he's talking about here is animals that that you might raise to slaughter. You might be raising them to eat, for example. Say you're raising raising chickens, meat chickens, you know, raising meat chickens, and you're, you're raising them to eat. Well, those chickens are no good except for when they're dead. Now, they might give you a little fertilizer along the way, right, Greg? Or they might, they might take care of some weeds in your yard and everything. But despite those things, those animals, uh, and, and I hope PETA is not listening in on this sermon, uh, but they are better off dead than alive because that's what they were meant to be. They were being raised to consume, to kill them, and to eat them. That's what God made these animals for. The analogy here is breathtaking if you think about it. Peter is saying these false teachers are better off dead than alive. He says the only good false teacher is a dead false teacher. That's the language that he's using. That's what I'm saying. That's why I don't know what other word to use other than than an off-the-charts rant that Peter is doing here. But remember, he is giving us this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So we as men of God, as women of God, as people of God, read this text as a strong warning against these false teachers. He said they are destined to be destroyed. And then he closes, if I counted correctly, that was about seven characteristics I told you that flow in. Oh no, there was, there was, uh, we're not finished. I thought that, that was the last one. Then he says the matter that I mentioned earlier. He said they blaspheme against matters which they are ignorant. Of which they are ignorant. He says they're talking about things they don't even know anything about. They're, they're talking and talking and they need to stop talking because they don't even know what they're talking about. And like I said, that when you compare, when you uh, connect those two, both arrogant and ignorant, that's when you're really in trouble. And so he says, here they are as false teachers. They're ignorant. They don't put a high priority on learning. They don't put a high priority on investigation. They don't put a high priority on Bible study. They don't put a high priority on what God says. All they care about is what they say and what they want, and what their will is, and pushing that boldly, instead of humbly, subserviently, surrendering their will 
to God. And so he says that they are ignorant. And he says they will also be destroyed in their destruction. So I think if I counted correctly, that was seven characteristics there. And he finishes it up there in the end of verse 12 with sort of a word play. And the ESV does a good job at, at bringing it out because he uses the same word tri- uh, twice, one in, in different tenses, that in their destruction, they will be destroyed. He uses a similar, similar type of word play in the first few verses of this chapter when he, when he says that they are teaching destructive heresies, damnable heresies, and at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to be destroyed. They're the ones that are going to be damned. They're the ones that are going to reap the whirlwind of what they are sowing. And so Peter would have the men and women of God to warn, be forewarned that false teachers, and just to remember as we began this study, he's not talking about the false teachers that are out there in false religions. He's talking about the false teachers that creep in among us, into our churches, into churches that claim the name of Christ, churches who may even call themselves Reformed, those that may even say that they have a high view of Scripture. We need to look at not only what they are teaching, but also their conduct, their character, their personality, and be warned against them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we are warned against these false teachers and their characteristics, we bow before You as well, looking out for these characteristics as they may creep up into our lives. That we might approach Your Word humbly and ask for Your forgiveness. When we so too often see these characteristics in our own lives, And Lord, if I could take a moment of personal testimony, too often as the pastor of this church, these characteristics have been evident in my life. And I'll repent. And so Lord, I pray that you would keep us humble and keep us beneath the cross, rejoicing in the grace of God. Keep your people safe. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.